Good afternoon, Tech Nation. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are excited to have just over 700 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for .1 CE credits from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Tech Nation Tour t-shirt for answering this trivia question. Seattle is the birthplace of which famous rock guitarist, singer, and songwriter? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to join us for the MD Expo, which will bring HTM professionals from across the nation to New England for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. Registration is now open. Receive complimentary admission by using the VIP Pass Compliments of Fluke Biomedical found in your Webinar Wednesday workbook. All right, and the winner of our Tech Nation Tour t-shirt is Michael O'Brien. Congratulations, Michael. The correct answer is Jimi Hendrix. Tech Nation would like to thank our sponsor, Fluke Biomedical, the premier global provider of test and measurement equipment and services to the healthcare industry. Fluke serves biomedical engineers, quality assurance technicians, medical physicists, oncologists, radiation safety professionals, and is continually expanding their solutions to, brought, to a broader range of health and safety professionals. Learn more at flukebiomedical.com. Our presenter today is Don Gessling, Senior Engineer of Fluke Biomedical. Donald, you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay. Hello everyone and welcome to Fluke Biomedical's educational webinar. My name is Don. I'm going to lead the today's presentation on the fundamentals of pulse oximetry. My primary job is in engineering writing the embedded firmware that controls our equipment. In the room with me is John Sherlock, who many of you may already know. John is our customer support specialist who helps customers with technical questions. And also here is Jerry Zion, our global training manager. And together, I guess we've all three been quite a while here. We have more than 100 years of experience, combined experience, developing medical test devices. And i got to say, we're here in the Seattle area, so that trigger question was pretty simple for us. <laughs> so, uh, what is pulse oximetry? It's the measurement of the oxygenation of the arterial blood. And there's an acronym, SPO2, Pulse Oximetry Monitors SPO2, and the acronym stands for the Saturation of Peripheral Oxygen. And the amount of saturation means how much of the arterial blood is carrying oxygen. So 100% saturation would mean all of it is oxygenated. The pulse oximeter reads out in percentage of the arterial blood that is oxygenated. Biomedical equipment professionals should be well grounded in the fundamentals of this very valuable technology in order to understand it adequately. So we're going to start with basics and cover the details. And I've always been fascinated by this technology because it's fairly simple. It's just shining light and it does so much. So I like talking about it. So. What can it do? Arteries carry oxygenated blood throughout the body. Arterial blood comes from the lungs where it is picked up oxygen, gets pumped through the left heart chambers to the aorta, then to the arteries. The arterial blood moves in pulses as the heart beats. Pulse oximetry measures the oxygen in these pulses of arterial blood in a peripheral part of the body, typically a finger. A pulse oximeter can work quickly, getting the result in a few heartbeats. It checks that the arterial blood is indeed carrying oxygen. But here we have a nice picture of hemoglobin. Actually, we have a picture of red blood cells. And hemoglobin is a protein in the red blood cells that can carry oxygen to the body. So in the blood, the arterial blood, the hemoglobin, well, any blood, Hemoglobin can be oxygenated or not. 
A pulse oximeter measures a percentage of hemoglobin in the arterial blood that is oxygenated. So in the picture, you have the uh, little oxygen molecules going into the red blood cells, and then it's, that happens in the lungs, and then it rides on the hemoglobin down the arteries into the cells, and then it releases the oxygen. And of course, uh, arterial blood is bright red. And I don't know if I've ever seen arterial blood, because most people, when you cut yourself, all you see is the venous blood, which is a dark red. So <clears throat> pulse oximetry is very important measurement for patients. It gives a very quick determination if patients are having trouble getting oxygen into their bloodstream. So if they have trouble, it can be treated as soon as possible. And here's a brief note about the history of pulse oximetry. And here we just have a picture of an old operating room. They have doctors and nurses there still in gowns and hats there. But they didn't have pulse oximeters. So before, before pulse oximetry, there was no quick way to analyze the oxygen content of blood. They could do it invasively by drawing real blood and running tests on it. And that took time that patients couldn't necessarily afford. Especially on the operating table, under anesthesia, patient systems are under stress. Before pulse oximetry, thousands of patients died of undetected hypoxemia, which is the low level of oxygen in the blood. Now, the pulse oximeter is ubiquitous and can be found in most hospital rooms and emergency facilities. And I'm sure everybody's seen them, the finger clip, but it's always in the, uh, the intensive care and other wards. You just, you just always have it on your finger if you're sitting there, and it can be alarmed. And you just know immediately. Blood oxygen is routinely measured. Doctors and nurses now know immediately whenever blood oxygen is low. So the pulse oximeter is a very good device to have available. And here's how it works. Pulse oximeters shine light through the human body. Typically, it is a finger. But also feet, earlobes, and foreheads are used. Some oximeters reflect light off the body part rather than shine light through it. So we're going to mostly talk about the fingers here because that's the most common. So here's how the most common oximeter configuration works. The oximeter shines two different wavelengths of light through the patient's fingers using light emitting diodes, LEDs, one at a time. So the two wavelengths of light are red, and that's approximately 660 nanometers, and infrared, approximately 900 to 940 nanometers. Uh, I want to say these. Wavelengths are approximate because every manufacturer might be a little different, but it's typically it is in the red or the infrared range, both actually. So, and of course, uh, red is the slowest frequency of light in the visible spectrum, and that's why it has the longest wavelength. And then infrared light is an even slower frequency of light just outside the uh, visible spectrum, and that's the light that can deliver heat to you from, say, an infrared uh, light bulb, heat you up. Anyway, it's right next to the red in the, in the spectrum of light. So there are two LEDs in the oximeter, and one is the LEDs are special in that they are designed for those wavelengths of light. So it shines, the detector, the LEDs shine through the finger. And they shine one at a time. And it's sequenced fairly rapidly. So the, 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 they're turned on and off many times faster than the heartbeat pulse. So the detector on the other side of the finger measures how much light passes through the finger from each type of light. 
So the exhibitor only needs one detector that can detect either light because it knows which light is shining at the time. So the detector just has a wide enough band to detect both types of light. Okay. So the light is absorbed by the finger. And it turns out that the, the light that's absorbed by the hemoglobin in the blood has a certain characteristics of absorption. And here's a chart that shows you what it is. So the red vertical line there is for the red light. And then the curves are for the uh, amount of absorption. And the infrared is the vertical, the blue line there. So you can see that they're different at the different frequencies. So oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more infrared light and allows more red light to pass through. And deoxygenated hemoglobin is the opposite, allowing more infrared light to pass through and absorbing more red light. So you can see that the information is there. All we have to do is measure it and analyze it. So that was how they invented the oximeter is that they found this relation between the light and the absorption. So whatever light is not absorbed shines through to the detector and gets measured by the SpO2 monitor. So then the SpO2 monitor has measured the amounts of red and infrared red light detected. It calculates the ratio of red to infrared, and it can tell from that the percentage of saturation. But there's a little more to, to the equation, because there's more to a finger than just hemoglobin that the light has to pass through. There's the rest of the finger. It includes the venous blood, tissue, bone, skin, and whatever else is in your finger, maybe, uh, the SpO2 monitors are interested only in the transmission ratio caused by the hemoglobin, not by everything else. So since everything else is constant and the only thing varying is the pulse of the arterial blood, they analyze the light transmission, break it into AC and DC components. So we're using electrical anal analogy here. It's not really alternating current, but it's, it's alternating blood. So the AC is the varying level caused by the arterial pulse. And DC is the average level caused by everything in total, which includes the arterial blood. So the DC level is the average measurement over the whole time. And the AC level is a change from the steady state level between pulses to the level during a pulse. So that level goes up and down as the pulses. So these AC and DC components can get combined into the final overall calculation as shown. So we have the picture, the ratio. It's really a ratio of two ratios. So we have the red AC divided by the red DC uh, as the top of the overall ratio. And the, the infrared AC divided by the infrared DC below the, uh, the line. So the ratio is, is the ratio of the red factor divided by the infrared factor. So by calculating the ratio this way, variable factors in a finger are eliminated, such as skin color, finger thickness, and the amount of blood pumped. So SpO2 monitors use a lookup table of ratios called an R-curve. R-curves have been determined by clinical, clinical trials by the manufacturers. Since there is no scientific reference available to characterize the human body, 
The manufacturers have experimentally measured the ratios that will be obtained at known saturation levels. So as you can imagine, there's no physical laws that you can just say, okay, this light is going through hemoglobin, it's got to have this ratio. Uh, you have to be determined experimentally. And they've done this by having actual human subjects that they force them to breathe air that might not have enough oxygen over the range and get them to have a certain level of uh, oxygenation. And then they take the ratio that they measure at that point and then they take an actual blood sample and analyze the blood oxygen chemically. And that's how they're determined as arcers. And you can imagine they don't want to do this very often because it's a big job. Anyway, they put the values that they've determined into what we call the R curve lookup table. So an R curve associates each point of saturation with the light ratio that it'll produce. And here's a picture of a typical R curve. So <coughs> At the highest saturation, it has the lowest ratio. Okay, the SpO2 monitor calculates the light ratio, then looks up the saturation level that corresponds to it in our curve. So with this curve, if your ratio was uh, 1.2, then uh, you go up to the R curve and you find out, well, that's 80 on this particular R curve. And that's all they do. So maybe you want to test the SpO2 monitor. Well, it just so happens Fluke Biomedical has some functional testers that can be used. And uh, these are called the ProSim Spot is the device on the left, and that's and the device on the right is called the spot light. So ProSim Spot is a plug-in module to the ProSim 8 patient simulator. So the, the spot is the, is the small device on the end of the cable there with the finger sticking out of it. And the ProSim 8 is the patient simulator that's there. It's got the display on it. So those two devices work together. The ProSim 8 provides the user interface, and it is the most full-featured tester. Spotlight is a standalone tester, and it has somewhat less capability. These testers are the latest technology developed by Fluke Biomedical, working with experts in the field. Now here is an important point. These testers are not true simulators. In fact, the FDA has declared that they not be called simulators. A finger simulator would have to actually have the light shine clear through it and contain a pulsing medium that would mimic hemoglobin oxygenated at various levels. So we're not doing that. So we're required to call these functional testers. So fluke testers pretend in a different way to be a human finger that can be programmed for a wide range of variables for the most comprehensive testing available. Luke calls these test devices functional testers because that's what the FDA calls them. Luke does list them in its catalog along with its simulators. However, but don't be fooled, the ProSim spot is an accessory to a patient simulator, but it is itself a functional tester. So, uh, Okay, so here's how they work. Fluke SpO2 functional testers pretend to be a finger. Even though they are not simulating a finger, they can fool the SpO2 monitor into thinking it is monitoring an actual finger. The tester has two light detectors with a filter over one of them. So it can discern the type of light, <coughs> either red or infrared. So <coughs> So here on the picture, we have the uh, what we call the sensor on the right. That's the uh, 
SPO2 monitor finger clip, and it's got two LEDs in it shining. One is the red and one is the infrared. And it's shining onto the tester finger, which is detecting, that's actually two detectors there, one for uh, each of the each of the wavelengths. So as the monitor shines the light onto the top of the finger of the tester, the red and infrared light in succession, the tester will measure the amount of light of each of those, decide which light it is, either red or infrared, then calculate for the test settings how much of that light would be shining all the way through an actual finger. Then it turns on its own LED on its bottom so it looks like it is shining like the light is shining through the finger with that amount of light that it's calculated it needs. So the LED that the tester shines has a wide enough band with of light to be detected by the monitor and there only needs to be one light detector in the monitor. So we've already said that you can detect either wavelength because the monitor knows which wavelength it is outputting, therefore that is the wavelength it will be detecting. So the tester is running heartbeat pulses that approximate the shape of an arterial pulse. It varies the light according to the current amplitude of the pulse. So between pulses it gives just the DC light and during the pulse it gives the AC plus DC light. So you might ask, why use a tester instead of your finger? Well, we, we'd like to you to use a flute tester, of course. Well, one reason is that your finger can test the oximeter only for the current state of your finger, which is unknown. And a typical healthy patient has a very stable SpO2, and it's, it should be in the mid to high 90s. And I know I've had one on my finger, and it just uh, seems to sit there at the same, same number all the time. So a tester allows you to vary the settings across a physiological range of variability. So there's a whole lot of different patients in there. We can vary, vary settings so you can test do a lot of things. Anyway, the, the variables I want to discuss are the full range and the ProSim spot with the ProSim 8 patient simulator. And the spotlight has some of these variables, but not, not the full range. So the variables are, the obvious ones are first oxygen saturation. And we can vary that, that setting through the range of actual percentage that could be encountered. And not like, and that's 30 to 100 percent, actually, on both testers. And that's, you're not likely to count anyone with 30, because I don't think they'd be still alive. But anyway, we can, uh, we can test for that. And then the heart rate can be varied from the slow to the fast rates. And then, okay. And in, in the ProSim 8 with the spot, all the heartbeat signals are synchronized, so the ECG and blood pressure beats are all the same beat time to be physically accurate, physiologically accurate. Okay, so here's some of the some of the other variables you can you can accept. Transmission level is the percentage of light that's transmitted through the finger, and we set those by uh, characterizing different types of fingers, a dark, thick finger, a medium finger, a light, thin finger, and a neonatal foot. And of course, a good SpO2 monitor should be able to account for all types of fingers, because not just the easy ones, which of course would be light and thin, which would allow light to easily shine through, but some more difficult fingers still need to be tested, or measured, rather. We have pulse amplitude also called perfusion. 
It's the amount of arterial blood delivered to the finger in each heartbeat. So during a heart pulse, less light overall will be transmitted because of additional blood in the finger. So the setting is in percent, is how much light level varies from the average DC level during a pulse. So this tests how well the monitor works in a difficult situation where the patient is not pumping very much blood. So of course, you're going to encounter all kinds of patients. You need to measure them. And an ambient light artifact is a setting of extra light that could be in a patient's environment that could interfere with SPO2 monitoring. So you can imagine if there's a light shining on the, the patient's finger, that's going to change things. So a good SPO2 monitor should work well even when there's various lights in the area. And we can set the light to uh, various settings. Okay, and uh, another thing you can vary is respiration artifact. So when a patient breathes, it can actually affect the pulse. And it, it similarly can affect the blood pressure pulse. So as you're breathing, the chest, it, in the maximum part of the breath, when you inhale, there's pressure on the chest, and that can reduce the amount of blood being pumped in a not-so-healthy patient. So the SpO2 monitor should reject that effect, and we can, uh, we can put that effect into the thing with our, uh, our tester. Okay, those are all the variables that you can set with a fluke functional tester. So now I want to mention R curves. When you're using the tester, you must select the R curve that, ma that matches the manufacturer that you're testing, because they vary a bit. And they've all been de uh, determined by this experimental method. They might not all have come up with the same answers. And besides, the components used in the monitors might be a little different from brand to brand, such as the light emitters and the detectors. So you have to select it. Anyway, Fluke has worked closely with some manufacturers, and they have supplied their R crews to Fluke. And those, these are listed as Nelcor, Massimo, Nonan, and Neon Coda. And then some R curves we're not able to get from the manufacturers, but Fluke has figured these out experimentally simply by setting up the tester to work at a certain ratio and see what percentage the SPO2 monitor measured and going through the whole range and creating our, our own arcers. And those are MindRay, GE, Omega, and Philips, and BCI. And I might mention that some of these companies Typically, they purchase each other or they're leasing technology for SPO2 from some other company. So um, if, if it's not a primary of your monitor, you, got, you have to know what, what technology you're using. I hope that was not too confusing. <laughs> anyway, there's a special oximeter that deserves a little... Uh, consideration called the Massimo Rainbow. So now manufacturers are using light to monitor other parameters besides oxygen. So notably, the Massimo Rainbow uses eight wavelengths of light for additional monitoring of hemoglobin. So some hemoglobins cannot carry oxygen, and we give them the general name of dyshemoglobins. And one important situation is when the carbon monoxide gets bound to the hemoglobin, then that's called a carboxyhemoglobin. And that's very bad because that prevents oxygen to be carried. And of course, that happens when you have a power failure and you decide to barbecue in, indoors, and you should never do that. <laughs> so another situation is certain iron molecules are in the, the red blood and they're not the type 
that can carry oxygen. So these hemoglobins can't bind to the, the oxygen. So and these are called met hemoglobins. So the rainbow with all those wavelengths of light can detect the percentage of these hemoglobins and it can also do some other things. So Fluke has worked with Massimo to figure out how to test the rainbow. And Massimo helped us and designed a special cable that interfaces to the finger sensor that clips on to the Fluke tester. And there are special parameters to set for the rainbow test that we don't have time to get into right now. But you connect the cable up and you, you run the test. And Massimo has approved this test to be adequate for the rainbow to be tested by the fluke testers. And the testers are still only using the two wavelengths of light. But it's OK by Masmo. And you can get that cable from fluke. So we're getting uh, towards the end. And I want to mention what certain trends are in the field of pulse activity. So it seems like there are more reflective light technologies that don't shine through the finger. They shine light into the tissue and measure the light reflected onto a sensor. And now that those are happening, it's easier to build oximeters into personal devices. And if you just sit, do a simple search on the internet, you'll find many things, options now available, including some finger clips have integrated displays, so that's all there is to it. There are accessories for smartphones that plug into a smartphone jack. And the phones themselves have been uh, programmed to work as uh, SPO2 monitors without any accessories. And also, there's a big push on the personal fitness training monitors. and notably the Fitbit, and uh, I don't know if they have SPO2 monitors, but uh, others do, or they do, or they'll have them soon. Anyway, there's, I would expect more and more usage of light for analysis of body things. So to tie it all together, I just want to say again, pulse oximetry is a very important life-saving technology. And it looks like it's de destined to become even more common in personal devices and everyday life. And uh, we hope the webinar has been helpful and informative. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't really say have a nice day here, because we want you to stay tuned. If you have a question, maybe you've emailed it in already, or if you want to listen to the, the questions other people have asked. And I want to mention we have an application note that uh, you can get on the Fluke Biomedical website. And we have additional training is available, and Jerry Zion would be in charge of that. And uh, there's all these things listed here you can get on our website or get it get connected and then uh, we're essentially finished and we're going to open it up for questions and it's on the screen we have our contact information okay thank you donald uh, we've got a few questions for you um, should I be testing the sensor, cable, and monitor of an SpO2 sensor? What cable? What was the cable again? Should I be testing the sensor, cable, and monitor of an SpO2 sensor? So, so this is Jerry uh, Zion. The the answer is yes. Um, when you when you test, you want to test everything that's going to be used clinically uh, on the patient. And that would include the, uh, the sensor, unless the sensor is a single patient use disposable uh, type. Um, so mostly uh, 
in the United States, we see a lot of those single patient use disposable sensors. But you need to have something that's representative. And then the cable is also important. 90 plus percent of the problems that you're going to have with pulse oximetry is going to be the sensor or the cable or both. And very little will you have a problem actually with the, the uh, electronics in the patient monitor. So the, it's important to test all of the things that you're going to be using with the, with the patient and then make sure that if you have anything that fails, the sensor or the cable, uh, that you remove those from clinical use completely. Because otherwise what's going to happen is they're going to show back up on a different patient monitor. You're going to record it as a different problem. It's really the same problem. It just moved from one to the other. So make sure you're testing it all. Remove anything that fails from clinical use. Thank you, Gary. The next question we have, how does one skin affect testing pulse oximetry? That would uh, depend on the, like the pigmentation of the skin and the amount of light would be going through would be different. Um, all right, so if you have a dark skin, there's be less light that can get through there, and it's harder on the oximeter. You know, it has to be uh, very well designed in order to handle all the different situations of fingers, and including, you no, know, not just the the skin color and the thickness of the finger, but also that amount of blood, what we call the perfusion, the amount of blood that's being pumped. So a good oximeter has to has to work through a, a, a range of these variables. So this is Jerry. I just want to elaborate on that. The there's two problems here. One is a clinical problem of the uh, of the uh, diversity of patient pigment uh, skin pigmentation that has to be dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, and um, uh, the other the another problem is the huge increase in the number of tats, tattoos that people are wearing. And those actually can affect the measurement as well, depending on where the tattoo is placed. Further, there are a lot of uh, ladies and some others who like a deep purple fingernail polish. And those should be, those polishes need to be removed before, uh, before the patient is being assessed for um, O2 saturation in, uh, using a pulse oximeter. Um, these show up in the operating room, my friends, every single day of the year across the whole world. So um, this is really a problem that your clinicians face a lot more than you're going to face as biomedical technicians and engineers, but uh, they do exist. Don is right. A really good pulse oximeter is able to deal with them or has provided instructions in its operating manual for what to do about it. Primarily, um, there's not a lot you can do about a tattoo that's in uh, the, r the wrong place at the wrong time, but there is something you can do about that nail polish. You can remove it. Um, uh, if you have false fingernails with the dark purple pigmentation, that's a problem. So if you can't measure that uh, um, non-invasive uh, oxygen saturation, then you're going to have to draw more blood gas samples. Now, in the United States, that's not so much of a problem because we do have uh, stat laboratories that are close by the OR and close by the ICU. But in the emerging markets and other parts of the world, those don't exist. And so it's, uh, it becomes more of a problem. So skin pigmentation, as Don said, reduces the amount of light that can pass through the finger or the toe or the earlobe uh, or, or, or even the baby, uh, uh, the foot of the baby. So that difference causes problems sometimes for some oximeters. Good place to, in time to uh, discover this is on incoming inspection. We also call that um, acceptance testing. So when you get a brand new patient monitor you've never seen before, it's really not a major brand, uh, as can happen, you probably ought to put it through its paces and really change that skin pigmentation in the functional test to make sure it's going to be able to stand up to daily clinical use. 
So uh, think twice even before you get that finger tattooed. <laughs> 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 Will do. <laughs> I'm curious to see what tattoos we're putting on our fingertips anyway, but that's a conversation for another time. Our next question is going to be, what are the differences in testing SpO2 for adults versus infants or young children? Anybody know? So, well, so this is another really good clinical question. Um, adults have a whole have have a whole range of, of part problems of, with the cardiovascular system than infants and neonates typically do. There's a few um, uh, problems that a neonate can have that are that are birth defects that need to be uh, that, that that present. So if you have a septal defect where you have a, a shunt of blood from right heart to left heart like it's like a little hole in the middle of the inside the heart and the blood is moving back and forth between the left heart and right heart that's a problem it's a real serious problem and there are ways that are that those are dealt with um, uh, you can have a problem that's actually a lung problem uh, called uh, B B P M D. I think is the the uh, nomenclature for it and basically what it means is that the baby cannot um, does not absorb oxygen so oxygen and carbon dioxide don't really exchange well across the tissue that needs some surfactant and some very special interventions and typically the baby's going to be on oxygen they'll be in an incubator and uh, it's just really really touch and go for a long time for those babies um, so there's a range of specific problems for neonates and children that um, that are quite different other than that they have pretty good saturations. Um, they don't have a lot of oxygen reserve, however. So if they begin to uh, lose oxygen saturation, there isn't a lot of extra tissue that's going to be able to uh, provide that oxygenation breath by breath. Those infants are going to be treated with uh, a therapeutic oxygen delivery, either through nasal cannula or sometimes a mask or something like that. Adults, it's it's quite a bigger range because uh, we have all kinds of other problems with uh, perfusion of the blood and the how well or how poorly we're able to pick up the oxygen in the uh, as it pass, as the blood passes through the lungs. We have we smoke um, lots of different substances, and that blocks the ability of the uh, oxygen to transfer across the tissue. So there are a whole range of those kinds of problems. So you have, uh, there are also different ranges of heart rates that we're typically dealing with. Children actually a little bit faster heart rate, uh, up to 60 beats per minute. And adults mostly are hanging in, uh, unless they're very, very sick, are hanging in around, uh, uh, around 50 or 60 beats a minute for a little baby 60 beats a minute is really really fast um, so those are some of the clinical differences between uh, doing the, the measurement and simulation the specifications of the uh, oximeter incorporated into the patient monitor are going to be disclosed in the operators manual and the service manual of that monitor by the manufacturer and the O2 saturation accuracy will also be specified. So you have pass-fail criteria that can be used. They will also provide procedurally the inspection or testing procedure that should be used. Those will be found uh, in the service manual in the test procedure uh, for routine testing for those monitors. And if they have two different patient ranges, they will have two different sets of parameters that need to be tested. All right, guys, thanks. We do have several questions that are in queue, but since we're right at our 60-minute mark, I do want to let all the attendees know, if your question was not asked today during the live webinar, we're going to go ahead and send all of them to our uh, presenter today, Fluke Biomedical. So a member of the Fluke team will be following up with you shortly to address your question. 
with that said, I want to thank Donald, uh, as well as Fluke Biomedical, for sponsoring today's webinar. One lucky attendee is going to win lunch for the whole department. Details on how you could be this lucky attendee are included in our post-webinar survey. That survey is going to appear on your screen momentarily. You must complete the survey to obtain the certificate of attendance to get the CE credit. If you do not see your survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Thanks, Tech Nation. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. See you next Wednesday.